Hello, everybody. I got the last run up to lunch. I hope you can stay with me here. Um, so just a quick show of hands. Um, how many in this room are, are in sort of manage, management leadership positions? Engineering R&D. Marketing. Okay, so um, who among you is responsible for your company's reputation? Show of hands. Smart audience. All right, excellent. All right, we can go. So today I'm going to talk to you about reputation and how it affects your bottom line. Here we go. All right, so um, three key takeaways for today about reputation. One, it's about storytelling. Two, it's everyone's business. And three, it doesn't stop. It's an ongoing process. So we're going to walk through each of these three key takeaways. I like to quote Shakespeare when I start this presentation. I think he said it best when the the purest treasure of mortal times can afford is a spotless reputation. And um, it's really true. And if you don't believe me, we've got here, and I've got to walk over so I can read it. These are some statistics from the Reputation Institute, whose sole business is to track this worldwide. Um, and in a recent survey on the importance of, of reput uh, reputation, rather, um, people or companies with great reputations, uh, people are 83% more likely to buy your products. They're 82% more likely to say something positive about you, and they're 82% more likely to recommend your products to someone else, and on and on. So you can see that this really does have an impact on your bottom line. Another fact, um, we know that in our space, there's near zero unemployment right now. How many of you are looking to hire in your organizations? OK. So if you look at this statistic that came out of Glassdoor, 69% of candidates are likely to apply to a job if the employer actively manages its brand. And on a scary note, 69% would not take a job with a company that had a bad reputation even if they were unemployed. Think about that. So let's talk about the storytelling. Um, reputation is really the result of a narrative. If you think about the brands that you engage with, um, you know, there's, there's a story behind their brand. There's a reason that, that it, they appeal to you. Um, they appeal to your wants, your concerns. They're not just pushing something at you. They're trying to understand you and, and, and appeal to your, to your wants and concerns. Reputation communicates a core promise. You know that when you do business with this particular brand, you're going to receive something from that brand consistently. Um, and lastly, it forms an emotional bond. Um, you know, this is a brands are are here to to make your life easier, to uh, to to do something special for you, and form that emotional bond. Now, let's talk about um, differentiation. Um, in my business, I do more than reputation management. Our firm does all communications, and one of the things that we start with with every single client, no matter whether they're a startup or whether they're you know, a, a brand name in the industry, is what is your narrative? Is it competitive, right? Um, and you can see that companies with differentiated narratives have a much stronger reputation. Um, it's hard to read these, but I can't stress that enough. And what I will tell you is that in the 11 years that I've run this business, and before that when I was at other agencies, um, the danger zone that almost every company falls into at some point in time is the sea of sameness. So, you know, do you have solutions that are innovative? Are you the leading company that blah, 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 blah? You'd be amazed. We picked these three companies that are brand names in the medical device industry and kind of looked at how they talked about themselves, and you just, you see a lot of sameness. So it's, you know, I, I challenge clients to be really rigorous with what, you know, what their true differentiation is and how do they tell that story, because you can spend as much money as you want on marketing communications, but if you don't really have a great story, you know, it's not worth it. So the question I have for you today on this note is, does your narrative stand out? You know, think about how you talk about your company, your business, what you offer to your consumer. Um, does it stand out? The second point, again, I made was that reputation is everyone's business, and everybody in this room knew that. Um, but you can see that it really begins at home with your employees. I mean, your employees, employees are your ambassadors of your brand. Um, it has a cumulative impact as you build out, whether it's your customers, shareholders, the media, um, et cetera. And the consistent narrative and experience is really key, because if you're going to drive a, a great reputation, you've got to walk the walk, you've got to talk the talk, and it's got to be consistent. So this is a few months old, but I wanted to bring this one up. Um, 
the irony of the statement on the United Airlines site. This was during the time when they had the, uh, the trouble, but you can see they're committed to providing a level of service to our customers that makes us a leader in the airline industry. So that's the talk, right? Well, oh, and then you have, sorry, go back. Whatever it takes to be friendly in the skies, right? This is literally on their website during this whole crisis. And then we had this, right? Um, and this just got played over and over and over. As you guys know, the media just, if they got, a, you know, they are like dogs with bones when these things hit sometimes. Um, and I would categorize this uh, this way. But um, you can see that, you know, this had a huge impact, just this one thing. And this is, you know, how your employees are behaving, right? Um, huge impact, stock plunge, lawsuits, calls for boycott. Um, so you can see it's just, you know, things that may not seem to be a huge big deal can have a huge impact on your reputation. So the question I have for you is, you know, does your team talk the talk and walk the walk? Um, you know, I'd encourage you if you're in any position in the company, you know, go talk to somebody that's not in your discipline in the company and ask, what does our company do? What are we all about? And, you know, see if the story is consistent, see if it's compelling. Um, you know, if, not, if it's not, you know, you've got some work to do. So ongoing process, um, familiarity is really key when it comes to reputation. Um, growth and familiarity directly impacts reputation by almost 13 points. Um, so you can't, people aren't gonna know, if people don't know you, you know, you're not gonna have a good reputation. So for the marketers in the room, you guys are gonna know this is a no brainer. Um, you know, you, it's, marketing is not just um, a shot in the wind. You've gotta have a you know, multi-touch point communication strategy to reach your, your target audiences. So it's, you know, the stakeholder experience, owned media, meaning your own content, paid media, earned media, which is PR. And you can see that companies that employ this multi-touch point strategy have an almost 9% bump in terms of reputation. So in addition to the multifaceted strategy um, in terms of marketing, you've got to commit to the long view. You know, it's not just we're going to do this campaign for three months and then we're going to go do nothing. I mean, you might as well not do anything. It's really, you've got to drive consistency over time with multiple touch points. What I like to say is, and you know this as consumers, repetition is what equals recognition. So let's talk about crisis for a minute. Um, you know, I presented this at, at the conference where I met Dan, um, and I walked through these steps of, you know, what you do in a crisis, and, you know, reputation can't prevent it, but it can help it. Um, one of the things, so before I get into the steps, I think that one of the things that I've seen with companies is they, you know, you can have a crisis plan put in place, but I think one of the first things companies should commit to is transparency. Um, you know, we saw what happened with Theranos, for example, um, you know, and especially when the media, you get a Wall Street Journal reporter getting some meat on dirt on the company, they are not going to let up, right? And then that just played and played and played and played. And, you know, part of it was, I mean, the, the crisis was bad enough as itself in terms of their technology, but the hiding it became a whole other story, right? So I would say, you know, commit to transparency. Um, anybody here go to USC? Anybody here following what's going on at USC? So their medical school dean, um, who is this prolific ophthalmologist who invented OCT, um, larger than life guy, brought in gajillion millions of dollars to USC, um, was found to allegedly have been um, partying with prostitutes, criminals, et cetera, et cetera, really bad stuff. And um, uh, if you've been following it, I, you know, as a PR person myself and a consumer of news, I've been voracious. The LA Times broke this and they just, it's the dog with the bone kind of thing. Um, but there was a great quote by a consultant in this week's article on sort of the process of when USC found out about it, who knew, what did they do, all that kind of stuff. And um, it's not apparent to me that they really were very transparent. I think they were trying to hide it and that in and of itself has become a story. But the quote is, um, secrecy is something that needs to have a compelling justification and when an institution has been in such reputational crisis as USC is currently experiencing, sunshine is indeed the best disinfectant. So I just put that out there because there's obviously methods for dealing with reputation, but I, or crisis, but I think that's you know that's got to be key. It's just a fundamental. But um, anyway, again, reputation can't prevent it. But if you've got a positive reputation, people are willing to give you the benefit of the doubt. Um, 
what do you do when you have a crisis? Step one is you assemble the team and gather the facts. I think in today's world of 24-7 media, social media, et cetera, people are really tempted to just respond right away without all the information, and that can get you into trouble. So assemble the right team, gather the facts, then step two, pinpoint the issues and develop the appropriate response. Um, you know, it's perfectly fine to say, you know, we are addressing this, we're working on this, but until you have all the facts, you know, don't go into detail. Um, and step three, again, communicate quickly, honestly, and openly, so there's the transparency. Um, and show compassion and a willingness to admit mistakes. I think that was another mistake that you guys probably remember, the CEO of United kind of, you know, I don't know, blame the passenger, you know, for lack of a better way to say it, until he realized that, I don't I shouldn't have said that. Um, <laughs> but anyway, you know, three, three quick steps to, to, uh, to respond to a crisis. But again, you know, again, the, I can't stress enough the importance of reputation and helping you overcome these issues. So question for you, is your organization prepared um, for a crisis? Are you man actively managing your reputation? So again, three key takeaways before we break for lunch. Reputation is about storytelling. It's everybody's business, and it's an ongoing process. Questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. How many of you guys uh, working with medical device companies are active on social media, meaning your company is active? OK. Um, and that means not just monitoring, but engaging, right? Um, well, I think, first of all, it's very important to just at least monitor what's going on in social media, because I think that, you know, unlike some industries, I think the medical device industry has been a little bit behind with social media because of FDA and being scared about, you know, what you can and can't say, and do you own something if someone says something off-label, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so first I would say, you know, make sure you're always monitoring what's being said out in social media, and I think that when you do have, um, you know, negative comments or whatnot, I think, you know, engaging and trying to diffuse is, is a good strategy. Um, you know, if someone's just incorrect about something, you know, just engaging and, and diffusing is, is the way to go. Can anyone speak to any experience in that regard, the folks who are active in terms of what your companies are doing? I think it's a good question. I think that it really depends on what kind of advice you're talking about. Um, I have an interesting story. You know, this was one of our first clients 11, 10 years ago, a co small company that was Kleiner Perkins, a portfolio company that had a knee replacement technology where they had these um, cutting guides used in surgery. And I don't know how much you guys know about knee replacement, but they basically cut the bone to fit the implant in. And what they discovered is they could have the patient undergo an MRI before the procedure. They would put it in their software program and basically recreate the knee as if it was a young knee, that person's young knee, and then they would figure out, okay, based on that knee, this is where the cuts need to be made, and they would manufacture unique cutting guides for each patient. And um, when they came to me, the VP, corporate VP said, we want to go direct to consumer, and we've got these cutting blocks. And I was like, seriously? Um, but after <laughs> watching a couple of procedures and talking to the patients and talking to the surgeons, um, we came up with this concept of custom fit knee replacement. Um, that it's, it's this way to customize the knee to you. And at the time, as we were following the patients, they seemed to be doing better, better range of motion, better, um, faster recovery, things like that. That's what we were saying in the initial patients. So we ended up, um, and they smartly partnered with Stryker and Biomet to lump their technologies together with the implants. And um, so we did a direct-to-consumer campaign in the local markets where they were, and it was very, very successful to the point where I even got calls from patients. Um, so it's, you know, it's interesting, and now we have this whole custom fit implant thing that's kind of, everyone's kind of jumped on the bad wing. And so it really, I think it depends. I mean, if it's a pacemaker, I think you're going to trust your doctor. You're not going to say, like, gee, like, give me all the specs. I want to know all that stuff. But if, you know, if it's, if it's relevant to you and it's understandable to a consumer, and you might actually, and I think today, even now, consumers are more empowered because um, there's more information out there. It's, I, again, it's, I think it's device dependent. Did that answer your questions? Okay. <laughs> All right. All right, well, let's break for lunch. Thank you.